Welcome to Wind and Rain. Wind's up to 60 miles an hour today. This morning we're going to load six pigs and take them to the butcher. So we castrate at two to three weeks of age, put them back in with their mom, and then after they heal up, we give them a week or two longer. And in about six weeks, we put them out. So we put them in a crate, we carry them out to the pasture there. And the pasture looked a lot different when we put them out. It was filled with bushes and grass and weeds and all that. Yeah, you couldn't even see the house really. Yeah, but... yeah. I remember towing the hut in there with the tractor. And then they stayed in the same pasture all summer. And that pasture's probably half acre. Maybe it's a little smaller than a half acre. And they stay in that one spot. They just eat away at what's in there and root up the roots and eat. And through the summer it was dry. Yeah, really dry. We had drought so, conditions. Yeah. And it was powder dry. Ooh. And then it started raining in September. September. And it got wet in there. And by that time, they chewed through a lot of what was in the pen. So now it looks like a moonscape. That's the way our pastures always end. They start green, and then everything's gone by the time it's time to go to butcher. We have three pig pastures at various places, mostly around where the barns and the house are. And pigs thrive best in an edge environment. So part of their pasture is treed and bushes and lots of different things to eat and then part of it is sunlit field picture a forest edge animal and they like that variety of things to eat we put them in one pasture each summer and we have three pastures so each pasture rests for two years some people move pigs from day to day they have pens like we use with our chickens and they'll pull them ahead daily weekly whatever it is we elected not to do that when we started out because we were worried about the pastures getting torn up. All of our pastures are planted. We make hay off of the same pastures. And if we were running pigs over them, even if we moved them every day, we'd wind up with rougher fields. So we elected to keep them in those designated pig pastures instead of running them across our fields, which means that the pig pastures get torn up by the time the pigs are done. And that's why we let them rest for a couple of years. We do bring a cattle prod for unloading pigs because yeah. the pig doesn't want to get off. We've had to pull them off with ropes before. I think it's more humane to use a cattle prod with a quick shock rather than putting through the prolonged stress of dragging out with a rope. That's nuts. And we can't use feed to lure them here at USDA butcher houses. So we'll see how it goes. You come in with me and come to the back. Actually, maybe we'll just work a few at a time.
deep ones is that you get a couple off, the rest will follow. And sometimes there's a reluctant one like this guy. You don't want to get them too excited or else they really lock up on you. Come on, buddy. There you go. No, no getting back on. Once you're off, you're off. We've had them get back on the trailer before too, so close the door. The lead take. Come on. Come on. There's a big step right over there and the pigs hate to go down that step. It really makes things a lot more difficult. I wish it were a ramp. It's the worst, it's the hardest thing about unloading here. So we gotta get the lead one off. It's really not the best. Before we had the cattle prod, sometimes we'd spend a half an hour here trying to get down this frickin' step. All right, this way. Come on. Jesus, you guys are great. Come on. Oh, pigs are hard. Six pigs. <laughs> Boy, that was a... These guys were tough. We never would have gotten them off without this. No. No way. I know people say, oh, cattle prod, bad, but the pigs, we've unloaded hundreds of pigs here, and the first hundred were without a cattle prod, and it was, it was a freaking nightmare without a cattle prod, and you can't entice them with feed, and you got this step to deal with, ah, it's just not, not easy. The pen card. The next thing to do is to fill out the pork cut sheets for the butcher because he starts butchering first thing in the morning he slaughters. Pigs are a little bit more complicated for us than cows. There's not as many cuts, but since you got six pigs, we get them cut in different groups. And you've got sausage to deal with, and our butcher does hot regular, which is breakfast and sweet. And we usually get the hot and sweet made into rope. We get a lot of ground pork made. For some reason, since COVID hit, ground pork's been selling a lot more than it used to. You go down the, the kind of standard list of cuts. Sometimes we keep the fat, sometimes we don't. We don't have anything done with the hocks anymore. Here's the big thing. It costs us about $2.25 a pound to have things smoked. Plus we lose 15 to 30% of the weight from curing and smoking. Smoking doesn't really make a lot of sense for us if we can sell the cuts fresh. Even though people say, oh, I love bacon and ham and all this stuff. It's money loser for us, so we don't do a lot of it. We'll do some hams for Christmas. We'll have two pigs or three pigs out of this six cut into bacon and smoked. The rest of it we sell as fresh pork belly for folks to smoke at home. It sells a lot better and it's more profitable for us to just sell it as uncut pork belly for people to do what they want with in terms of curing and smoking. Shoulders and most of the hams we have ground into sausage or ground pork. Spare ribs always, loin roasts or chops. We have a variety. We do some bone in loin roasts in the winter months. We do three quarter inch thick chops. We do inch and a half thick chops. I have to tell the butcher to leave a quarter to a half inch of fat on those chops. Otherwise he'll trim it all off. Butt roasts, three to five pounds. Um, customers don't want seven pound, 10 pound roasts. The three pounds sell better than anything else. It took a while to get the butcher to understand this is our market and you know we don't want huge roasts. So that's our pork cut sheet. More complicated than beef. But since we've worked with our butcher for a long time now, we sort of have a routine down. Tonight in honor of the pigs, we're having pork. Maybe that's not really an honor. I don't know. It's my way of honoring them. And that's delicious. We're going to start out with porky potatoes, which have of course, lard on them. Baked potatoes smeared with bacon grease. And some sea salt. And slow baked in the oven for an hour and a half or so. We're having a pork butt roast tonight. And you know, a lot of people say, oh, these are great for pulled pork. 
I don't think that's the best way to cook them. I call these the prime rib of pork because they have such rich flavor and if you cook the snot out of them to make pulled pork you lose some of that. Especially if it's smoked and then it just tastes like smoke. So I don't do it that way. I cook it in a rotisserie and put a nice crust on the outside of it. Cook the center of it to 140 degrees and it is tender and delicious. Now I put a rub on it which in this case is Montreal steak seasoning. I like this stuff for both beef and pork. in the rotisserie. She is done. 140 degrees in the center. Nice and crispy. I know if you're the same age I am, you were always taught as a kid that pink pork was something never to eat. But when the porks come from your own farm and you know how it was raised, there is nothing wrong with pink pork that's 140. I know people that cook it to 130 and eat it. Nice and marbled, juicy. Got a nice crust with lots of spice on the outside of it. And there we go, the prime rib of pork. Even though I always say pigs are a pain to raise, this is what makes it all worthwhile. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.